from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Library of Congress Center for the Book and the Children's Book Council this year named John Cheska the very, very first National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that he's either pulled his medal out behind me, or if he doesn't, I will be disappointed before this is over. Uh, many of you know John as the uh, author of many wonderful things, The Stinky Cheese Man, which won the Caldecott Honor. <laughs> the True Story of three, The Three Little Pigs. And his special new book for this book festival is an autobiography, and guess what it's called? Knucklehead. <laughs> and I think John will tell us a few stories about his life based on his life with his five brothers, which were he described yesterday in the ceremony at the Library of Congress, where Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress, presented him with that big, heavy medal that's in, medal that's in his pocket. We're really fortunate to have John as our first national ambassador. We can't think of a better person. He'll continue to promote books and reading around the country at the National Book Festival and at the Children's Book Week, which has now been moved to May next year. And I give you Mr. Ambassador John Cheska. I wasn't going to take my medal out, really. I'm kind of shy about it. But now that you've asked, <laughs> check it out. Oh, should I put it on? Oh, OK, you talked me into it. <laughs> nice, huh? I think I'm just going to wear it for the next year and a half, which is really going to surprise the guys at the bagel store where I live. <laughs> But I just got it yesterday from Dr. James Billington, who's the Librarian of Congress. There actually is a guy who is the Librarian of Congress. And I think it's such a cool thing because I get a chance to go out and just brag about all the great children's books there are out there. Like Stinky Cheese Man, <laughs> True Story of Three Little... No, no. no, I get to talk about everybody's books. Because I know all these guys in the business. Like Mo Willems, the guy who wrote Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. Or Tony D. Terlizzi, who did Spiderwick Chronicles. There's like a million great books out there. Neil Gaiman, who's here today. His new book in the graveyard, or Graveyard Stories, I think it is. Scary, but great, spectacular. So I'm going to just be wandering around for the next year and a half bragging about people's books. But today, I wanted to come and show you a couple of things I'm working on. Uh, John mentioned one of them. I'm also working on books for younger kids called Truck Town, which are just books about things that I loved when I was growing up as a little boy, trucks. And so I grew up with five brothers. And I think my dad, just to get us off his back, would sometimes take us to construction sites and just park us there. <laughs> Like it was a lot cheaper than the movies. <laughs> and we were fascinated. So a couple of years ago, I started thinking of these stories about all these trucks. And then we got some great illustrators like Dave Shannon, who did No David. Oh, he's not here. Don't applaud for him. Uh, Lauren Long, who did uh, Little Engine That Could. Dave Gordon, who worked on some movies with Pixar. And then I got to tell them all what to do which was really fun. <laughs> so what I did is come up with all these characters. There's 14 different characters who live in this world of Truck Town. And the very first book is a very thoughtful, deep, and kind of moving books about trucks and what trucks love to do. And it's called Smash Crash. <laughs> in fact, you could probably even help me with this book. Like when I say smash, if you say crash, that would be very helpful. So let's practice. Smash. Crash. Smash. Crash. Ooh, you guys are good at this. 
Oh, and I also would like to recognize our signer here. And I always wondered, like, how would you sign something like, <laughs> Oh, that's it? That's all I get? How about waza wuza wuda ha? How about minga ha minga bidi Oh, I know, I know that one. I get that one from my kids. A story by John Sheska. Smash. Smash. Oh, nice. Jack truck, dump truck Dan. Best friends, Jack and Dan. So they see this giant hole in the road. And Dan says, what are we going to do, Jack? What we always do, Dan. Smash. 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 Ooh, you guys are very good. But then a shadow falls. A big voice calls, hey, you two. Jack and Dan hit the road. Let's get out of here. They see their friend cement mixer Melvin. Hey, Melvin, you want to help us smash and crash? Melvin says, no, I'm very worried. I'll get messy. He says, oh, come on, Melvin, you can help us. And then they attack Melvin with a smash. Yes. Smash. And I think I better stop here because I don't want to reveal the surprise ending. <laughs> but it just keeps going on like that. And you haven't lived until you've read that story with a group of 250 kindergartners in an auditorium. <laughs> like, it's kind of nice we have a tent here and it floats up. But if you happen to have been up late the night before studying or something, and then came to the auditorium, <laughs> It hurts your brain. <laughs> so for librarians and teachers out there, this book comes with a warning. <laughs> do not read it on those days. Well, speaking of do not read that, um, I brought along a sneak peek at something that I wanted to show you guys. Unfortunately, it's not for sale yet. They're just selling the Truck Town books. But it's so brand new, I had to bring it. And in fact, Last night, after I got my medal, did, did you notice? Did I show you my medal? <laughs> after I got my medal, I spoke at the gala last night to Laura Bush, George, and their daughter Jenna was there too. And they asked me to speak and just talk for like, oh, I don't know, six minutes or so. And so I said, I gotta read them some knucklehead, don't you think? And the librarians of Congress were a little nervous and they said, John, we've read some of these stories. I don't think you should read some of those. <laughs> so I thought this is the perfect crowd for it. We should read some of those, right? <laughs> See, John, I told you. It's going to be OK. Because <laughs> these are just stories of me growing up with my five brothers. It sort of answers that question, where do you get your ideas? Or what happened to you? <laughs> There's nothing like growing up with five brothers who all fit in 10 years. To which most people say, your poor mother. <laughs> and I think there's something to that. She's a little twisted herself now. <laughs> but she twisted us, certainly, too. Because growing up in our house, it was mostly about wrestling. And so this book, I've also illustrated. Oh, I should probably explain, it's called Knucklehead because that's what my dad called us all the time. He couldn't usually remember everybody's name. <laughs> like he would go, J John, t you, whoever you, knucklehead, stop right there. <laughs> or he, it was just kind of a general term, like, oh, come on, all you knuckleheads, get out of there. And so we just sort of became knuckleheads. And this thing is illustrated with photos from my scrapbook, because well, I'm one of the older ones, I'm second oldest. And I actually have a scrapbook <laughs> where brothers number three and four kind of have like a baggie <laughs> with some stuff in it. Brother five and six. The saddest is actually brother six. He has a little baggie. And I think there's four pictures in it, and three of them are not of him. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> and since I'm the author, I get to pick the stories and the pictures. 
So here's a cool looking picture of my mom and dad when they were probably in their 20s or so. And then here's Jim and I from our school photo. We look cool. We've got like suits on, a tie, little handkerchiefs. Then it gets a little lax with Tom. He's got this kind of ratty tie on. By the time it hits Greg, he's got a nubby sweater. <laughs> Brian's got on a borrowed coat. <laughs> Jeff's barely got a shirt on. <laughs> That's kind of how it works in our family. And in our family, the way it also worked is my mom would always, always, always say, do not wrestle in the living room because you're going to break something. And we always, always, always told her, don't worry, we won't wrestle in the living room. Except for that time Jim jumped on me. Because that just wasn't fair. Like it was a sneak attack. So I got him in a headlock and I threw him on the couch. The couch broke. <laughs> so we tried propping the legs up again. <laughs> we tried gluing them with Elmer's glue. <sighs> Still didn't work. We said, oh no, we are dead meat. And my brother Jim said, no, no, don't worry. I'll tell mom what happened. I said, really? Good luck. My mom came in and freaked out. She said, who broke my couch? And Jim said, oh, you know what? Um, John did. <laughs> said, no, I didn't. Tom did. Tom said, no, I didn't. Greg did. Greg said, no, I didn't. Brian did. Brian said, no, I didn't. Jeff did. And Jeff was the littlest one. He couldn't blame anybody, so he just said, uh, the dog did. <laughs> so that's who always got blamed in our house. The dog. Even my dad would say, like, so who drank the rest of the milk and put an empty carton in the refrigerator? The dog. <laughs> There's also some really educational stories in here. <laughs> Why did someone laugh at that? <laughs> oh, there's also some very sweet pictures. Here is me with my missile and my rosary from St. Luke's. <laughs> That may have been the last time it was in my hands, I don't know. <laughs> we won't get into that. But when you have to babysit your brothers, my mom always used to ask Jim and I, she'd say, would you watch your brothers? And we never got paid. So we'd watch our brothers. We would watch Greg roll off the couch. <laughs> we'd watch Brian dig in the plant and eat the dirt. <laughs> and we'd watch Jeff lift up the toilet and play around in the water. <laughs> she didn't ask us to do anything. She just said, watch them. And one day, Jim and I figured out how to make money off this, though. We were watching Jeff, and he kind of got stuck under the couch. So we pulled him back out and stood him up next to the coffee table. Just like that. That's kind of nice. <laughs> and he saw an ashtray on the coffee table. So he picked out a cigarette butt and started chewing on it. And he made a face just like that. He went like, ah. So we gave him another one. <laughs> and he made an even better face. He went like, ah. And then we realized, hey, we could charge our friends money to watch this. <laughs> so we did. We invited all our friends in and charged them a dime to watch Jeff eat cigarette butts. Good to know, huh? <laughs> Oh, here's another tip if you're babysitting. Uh, it's another trick that we used. It's called the bad boy's home. Like when all their little brothers were running around and they were really nutty, we'd say, you better get in bed or we're going to call the bad boy's home. And they'd still keep running around. So we'd go over to the phone, pick it up, and dial a number, just go like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then we go, hello? Bad boy's home? <laughs> yes, we have two more. Come and pick them up. And then hang up the phone. And it's almost like magic. Whenever you hang up the phone, you'd hear a siren, like an ambulance or something. Woo, woo, woo. And our little brothers would run off into bed. So see, that's much better than tying your brother to bed with your dad's ties. Because we did try that once, too. And here's chapter 13 called Sorry, Mom. <laughs> it's an x-ray of a broken collarbone. <laughs> you know that little bone in the front part of your shoulder? The collarbone? Did you know it only takes seven pounds of pressure to break that bone? 
And we didn't either. <laughs> and my mom always used to say, take Greg, let him play with you. And we'd say, no, he's too little, he's too scrawny. She'd say, no, take Greg, let him play with you. We'd say, no, he's too little, he's too scrawny. Finally, we had to take him. And we used to play games, we played all kinds of games. We played baseball, football, basketball. We also played some games we invented on our own. Games like slaughter ball. <laughs> now in slaughter ball, you throw up the football and whoever catches it gets slaughtered. <laughs> it's kind of a guy game. Like I've read this to some girls and they say, why would you catch the ball? <laughs> Just like a woman to actually think the thing through. <laughs> because in the guy world, you want to catch the ball. You want to run into people. <laughs> so we always would catch the ball. But in one of our slaughter ball games, it kind of got to be a big jam pile. And something more than seven pounds must have landed on Greg. Because <laughs> we heard this. <laughs> so we had to take Greg back and say, sorry, mom, we broke him. <laughs> now, when you break your collarbone, you can't wrap it up like a cast, like if it's a broken arm or a broken leg. You get this big honking shoulder pad thing. Or at least you did when we were breaking Greg's collarbones. <laughs> we managed to break Greg's collarbone three, maybe four times. He's okay now. <laughs> he was a scrawny guy. And we said we didn't want to play with him. We got a lot of moms here. I'm digging myself in deeper, John. <laughs> and so we have an awful lot of pictures of Greg looking like this, like a pro football player all hunched up. <laughs> but he worked out fine. <laughs> well, there's a couple, some of the stories actually do have warning labels with them. I don't know, I won't get into those. But there's also some cute stories. There's stories about buying pagan babies. Any of you who went to Catholic school in the 60s? <laughs> like, I, I just wondered, like, how do you even explain that? <laughs> but that's in here. Because I should probably tell you, like, going to Catholic school back then, the nuns would come and say, we're going to save these little starving babies, and we didn't know where. They'd show us a picture of some starving baby and said, you can buy these pagan babies. So bring in all your money. And the deal was, whoever brought in more money got to actually name the kids boys versus girls. So the first time the nuns said this, we were so jazzed, we went out and begged, borrowed, and stole money <laughs> just so we could name the pagan baby. And the boys brought in the most money, and we were so jazzed, we had enough money for two pagan babies. <laughs> but then when it came time to name the babies, uh, we had appointed our spokesman, Tim Kowalsik, and Tim went up to tell the, our sister Margaret the name that we had chosen. And we decided we wanted to name our babies Al Kaline and Bill Freehand, <laughs> two famous baseball players on the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> As Tim explained it, he said, because I know K Kaline's going to hit bad at least 300, so we got to have a pagan baby. And the nun took one look at us and said, I think Matthew and Mark would be good names. <laughs> and all the boys went like, no way. And she wrote down, Matthew, Mark. And you know there's no arguing with nuns. So somehow there should be some babies over there somewhere named Al Kaline and Bill Freehand, but they're Matthew and Mark. And that's sad. <laughs> All right, I didn't realize that was such a sad story. I, I'll read a little more upbeat story about reading. Because this is what it's all about, right? Are there any readers in here? <laughs> oh, nice. Any writers? Any lacrosse players? <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in there. This one's called, and this kind of explains how I became a reader, or not. It's called Strange Books. I learned to read by reading very strange books. And these books we read in school were brightly colored stories about a weird alien family. Nothing like my family of tree wrestling, tree climbing, brother wrestling, bike smashing brothers. And nothing like the families of any of my friends either. This family was always neat, 
There was a boy, two girls, a mom, and a dad. And they talked in the weirdest way. So instead of saying like, hey, look at that dog over there, they would say, look, look, see the dog. <laughs> that is a dog. Now these alien kids were named Dick and Jane. <laughs> Strangest kids I ever heard of. And they had a little sister named Sally. She wasn't too bright either. And the mom and dad called themselves mother and father. And when I read these stories, I thought they were afraid they were going to forget each other's names because they kept repeating them a lot. So if Jane didn't see the dog, Dick would say, look, Jane, look. There is the dog next to Sally, Jane. The dog is also next to mother, Jane. The dog is next to father, Jane. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that is funny, Jane. <laughs> Did I mention that Dick and Jane also had a terrible sense of humor? <laughs> but at home, my mom read me real stories. These were stories that sounded more like our family, more like my life. There was a story about a guy named Sam, Sam I Am. He was a fan of green eggs and ham. And then there was also a story about dogs, yellow dogs, blue dogs, dogs that were up, dogs that were down, dogs that drove around in cars and then went and had a party in a giant tree. <laughs> go dogs, go! I read about them because I wanted to learn what was going on with them. So I guess I didn't really learn to read by reading about those weirdos Dick and Jane. I learned to read because I wanted to find out more about real things like dogs in cars and cats in hats. <laughs> well, I saved the, uh, the strangest one for last. This is the one they didn't think the president should hear. <laughs> but I think this crowd is strong enough. Yeah? <laughs> nice. Come on, you've been out here all day. <laughs> and John, you better close your ears, I think, because I don't think you're ready for this. <laughs> and this, this, <laughs> chapter is entitled Crossing Swords. And I think you might get a sense of where it's going once I start. And it starts with a picture of all of us. And it says, here's a picture of all of the Sheska brothers dressed up for Christmas. You can tell it's Christmas because there's that little manger scene behind us with the wise men, the donkey, some fake snow. There's also some extra touches that Jim and I put in there, like Davy Crockett. <laughs> and a guy with a bazooka. Because we just thought that made for a better story. Now this is a pretty, you don't get many pictures like this of the Sheska family, because it was hard to round us all up at once. And in fact, whenever we had to go anywhere, my parents would usually get the two little guys, Brian and Jeff, dressed. They'd put them in the car. Then Jim and I would watch them lock the car, go get Tom and Greg dressed, and then put everybody back in. Now, inevitably, when we got everybody in the car, somebody always said, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and my dad would say, you just went. Greg would say, I have to go again. And once the idea had been mentioned, it just seemed like a good idea for everyone. <laughs> now, this is the point when I'm reading this to a group of teachers and students. The teachers are looking horrified. They're remembering the title of the story. The kids are looking hopeful. They're thinking, could he? Would he? Will he? The teachers are thinking, oh, don't, please. <laughs> and once the idea was mentioned, it's every, everybody had to go. So Jim would say, I'm going too. Me too. Tom would say, I don't want to pee. I don't want to pee. 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 P. Oh, good, I know a new one. <laughs> but my mom would correct us. As a nurse, she insisted on the correct pronunciation and medical term for everything. So it, she would say, we don't pee, we urinate. Much harder. 
<laughs> and since it would take forever for all six of us to go one at a time, a lot of times we would go like two, three, four, five, six people at a time. <laughs> now this worked out great for the older brothers. <laughs> Not so good for the little brothers. <laughs> <laughs> now all the pieces are coming together. <laughs> Some people are going, no, no, stop. This is when the Secret Service guy would come and tase me, I think. <laughs> so one time when we were all going together, Jim realized it's kind of like sword fighting. And he just yelled out, sword fight! <laughs> and so it was. And it really didn't work out good for the little brothers because they were shorter and had to stand closer. <laughs> Mom, yelled Greg, Jim and John just peed on me. <laughs> no, said Mom, they urinated on you. <laughs> we didn't pee on him, said Jim. No, you didn't urinate on him. We were just sword fighting, I said. What, <laughs> said Mom. And my dad would say, Oh, all you knuckleheads, just get in the car. <laughs> so you guys have a sneak peek at this. It's not out in the stores until October 2nd. And it's got this great cover that looks like the war comic books that my brother and I used to love. And Driving the Tank is guess who? Ambassador John Sheska from third grade. <laughs> it's the best cover I've ever seen. But thanks so much for coming out to this. I think th this is just a colossal showing of caring about reading. And I think this is why we need to continue a great event like this, like the National Book Festival, because it just shows us all. So thanks to all you guys for being part of this. We'll keep supporting it with things like sword fighting. <laughs> ping, 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 ping. <laughs> I'm going to take her with me. <laughs> oh, I got to stop. <laughs> no, and much more lofty goals of educating children. Wait a minute, I'm going to remember for a minute. <laughs> no, thanks so much. Have a great time. I'm going to be signing from four to five down in the tent. Thanks, guys. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.